All righty. Well, welcome everyone. Um, where I'm at, it's morning. Where other people are at, it's evening. So a good day and good evening to everyone who has attended uh, today. Super excited to, uh, really excited about this talk and really excited to have Daniel here from our team to, to be giving it, you know, this all is sponsored by Serverless Guru and we are a serverless first consultancy uh, that really help companies uh, innovate faster in terms of their, their serverless transformations by leveraging serverless technologies. Um, and I think, you know, one of the largest values we provide is being able to, you know, uh, really allow companies to skip a large amount of complexity that comes with trying to reinvent the wheel when it comes to learning how to create enterprise production ready serverless applications themselves. Um, and I love doing it every single day. And I love that we have Daniel here to talk about it as I think I'm always amazed about the number of things that uh, he knows and is able to sort of solve and figure out. And so without further ado, I think I will, uh, you know, hand the baton over to Daniel and uh you know take it away thank you so much yeah okay hi everyone so a few words about me i'm there's already my picture here you don't see my face twice so i'm an able us enthusiast i'm a serverless enthusiast uh, before cloud and serverless i I used to manage racks and server inside, so like cabling, tripping, tripping over cables, 3IM runs to show to, to change the hard drive. So been there, done that. Um, so I'm, I was building web-based solutions since about 97. I tried to find the exact date, but it's around that, give or take. I started to run AWS stacks in production since 2010. And I jumped on the serverless wagon since it came out or since it was promoted by AWS since around 2015, 2016. So what we're going to talk today is about serving images on the, on the web. And you're all familiar probably with this one. So you have an HTML tag with, any, with an image, a source somewhere, and it gets displayed in your browser. Works pretty well all the time on your desktop, but then suddenly you start to have TVs, you start to have laptops, you start to have tablets, you start to have mobile phones. And suddenly your nice little image is either pixelated, too big, too small, or too slow to load. So what, was, what is kind of the first way of solving that? It's using a little picture tag where you start to put several images or several sizes of your same image. And that's all nice and neat. It works on all your devices. But now, what happens with a new device? So I tried to kind of get for this talk a list of all the screen sizes that exist. I think one webinar is not good enough to just go through all of them. So basically on Android, you have a plethora of sizes. Even on iOS, you have a plethora of sizes. And then suddenly you go into the TV space and yeah, they're just too many. And so what happened to your little picture tag in that case? There's a new device that comes out. Let's say that next month, uh, Samsung announces a 16K TV. And then suddenly, oh shit, all my images, I have to redo them. So you need to generate assets for new screen sizes, probably new formats, new devices. And where does that lead to? That leads to angry designers. So why do we bother for these different sizes? Why not just like take the biggest image you have and just ship that, like the biggest should probably fit them all. First, you want to have faster load speeds for your clients. You, you, so you, you, and you cannot then send a small image to everyone because you want the best content quality for everyone. And mainly for your business, you want to reduce your bandwidth costs. So you want to ship only what's needed and not more, not less. So for that, we can generate images on the fly. So you could do that in-house. So on your server rack inside your basement, uh, you have the upfront cost, you have maintenance cost, and worst of all, you pay for idle. So you'll pay for all that. You will pay the electrical bill, the aircon bill, uh, the people's salaries for something that is perhaps not used perhaps two days in a week. 
And so you could move to cloud instances, EC2, Docker. But still, you have maintenance costs. There's like the OS, the config. You still have to manage your self auto scaling. And you still kind of want always at least one or two instances around to like be ready to accept a request. So you still pay for idle. Less than in house, but you still pay for idle. So why not create all these sizes on the fly serverlessly? So there's many ways. If you look at AWS blogs or, or, or the websites, you will find many ways to do that. One of the, the one that comes out the most often is basically having an API gateway, a Lambda function behind it, take your images from, from a bucket and ship that to the client. So that's fairly easy to maintain, easy to set up, but your Lambda will be invoked on every request. And worst of all, especially if you are in a wider region, you don't leverage a CDN. Then the second option you see is running your functionality on Lambda Edge. And that works pretty well. So you use a CDN. Uh, the Lambda is only invoked if the image doesn't exist. So you reduce your Lambda uh, invocation costs. But it's hard to set up. And Lambda Edge has a few limitations, especially on the max body size. So as long as you are sending small terminals, it's really fine. But once you reach this body size that I forgot which, which one it is, it's a few megs. But for larger images, like a retina display starts to get problematic. So the simple and cost-effective way that I want to present here is that I make some assumptions. So first, I know that the client, the client knows what he needs. So he knows his screen size, he knows his DPI, he knows the format he's able to handle. And when I say screen size, not only screen size, it's also the image container size. So if the image is like 50% uh, screen width, th the client will know that, oh, I, my image is that amount of pixel. And all these parameters will be passed in one URL that is sty stylized here. So we, we first put the original path of the image as it's stored in the, in the, in the main storage. Then we have a ver version that's basically just to invalidate CDN cache. So if you have a new source image, instead of deleting or invalidating the CDN cache, you will just change this number and the cache will use a new cache key. Then you have dimension. That's where the magic happens, where you will put the dimension you want into your, for your image, the width, the height, the DPIs. Then there's just a name and the format. And format in that case could be a JPEG or WebP. So why just a URL, no query string? Is that a path like this is like makes the CDN and the client super happy in terms of caching. You don't have to, it's like the default cache key for every CDN is just the path. You don't have to, to look at query string to format this or that. Uh, it's still easy to extract parameter. You can just split on the slashes. And having the original path at the beginning means that you don't need any database to store the location of your images. So how do, will the request flow look like? So first one is when everyone is happy is that the asset is cached at the CDN. Your client will send your re the request to CloudFront and CloudFront replies with the image. Now if the CDN, if the asset is not cached at the CDN level, Client request to CloudFront. CloudFront says, I don't have it. Fetches it from a bucket, put it back into CloudFront and back to the client. That's your basic uh, static asset serving mechanism. And now what's interesting us is what happens if the asset is not pre-generated? So in, you, in our path we've seen, so we have a path to the image. That's the, the name of the image in our source bucket. Then we have a version just to cache, to build the cache. Then we have some parameters to say, oh, it's 272 width, 181 height, and I want to crop it. Then just a human readable title because the file name needs to be file name dot format, cannot just be dot format. And then a format, uh, in our case, uh, WebP. So what will happen? Client sends to CloudFront. CloudFront says, oh, I don't have it in my, like, look in, looks up in the bucket and says, oh, this doesn't exist. And it will return an HTTP 3.07, which means a temporary redirect. So it means that 
it will ask the client to say, no, I don't have that, but I know someone who has it. And the guy who has it is called API gateway slash path slash and the same, we use the exact same uh, path parameters. So your browser will then go to this new endpoint, which is an API gateway. And there you have a Lambda function that will take the source images from this path here. So that's why the, the source path is important. Take it from this bucket, do the requested transformation, store it back into the, the cache bucket, and send it back uh, and send back to the, the client a permanent redirect to say, no, actually, I don't have this image. This image is on my CDN slash path slash. And then the client will go to CloudFront, fetch it from the bucket, and the image is served back. So why is it simple and cost effective? So first, we use a CDN for all the repeated requests. Like most of the clients will share the same kind of image feature sizes, DPIs. The image will be generated only once and, and kept in S3 storage. So the images are only generated when they're missing. So it means the calls to API Gateway and Lambda are reduced to the minimum possible. So it's really like a static image host service. It has nothing different as if you would upload yourself the all the sizes directly in that bucket. There's a strong emphasis on caching, and there's no idle cost except for the storage. So it means that if nobody comes to request your image for one day, the only amount you will pay is the storage in this bucket and that bucket. Then obviously there are a few cons. The, the first request is a bit slow with all the back and forth. And there's a little bit more work on the client side. So the client has to actually request exactly what he wants. So let's see it in action. I hope it works. Not, not this one, this one. So I am, um, is it big? Uh, let's make it a little bit bigger. <coughs> is it okay, uh, Josh, for everyone to see? I believe so. Since you're the only one that can speak. Exactly. <laughs> I can see it quite well. Yeah, okay. So I, I'm using a, a framework called serverless, serverless.com for that. And with this framework, I create one, I have a Lambda function defined here, actually in a subfile. And this framework will allow me to create a function, create the API gateway and everything that comes with it. And if I just go to my function, or perhaps first this one, so I will just tell the function that I have a cache bucket. I have a cache domain, which is my CloudFront domain. And I have an event, which is an HTTP API event that says trigger when the path is this one. And you recognize here the, the naming convention that I had in the, in the slides. I just made it a little bit more simple because of the slashes here. I decided that all my images are in one root folder. And so then we need to define two buckets. So the first bucket is to store our original pictures. That's a really simple bucket. Uh, every public access blocked, and that's it. And you probably, I didn't do it. Oh, I did it here, yes. I enabled versioning on my bucket, just in case someone dumb enough to upload the same image as me, uh, I can get my, my real image back. And the second bucket we need is the cache bucket. That's where we will store all the resized images. So this one is a bit more complex because we need to use a trick here. We need to put it in a website configuration. What that means is that we can directly access this bucket through an HTTP endpoint without the need of authentication. And it's basically how you store your, how would store your um, static assets for any other website. And the little trick here is that I added a routing rule, and you can only do that if the bucket is a website. And I say that if the return code from S3 is 403, means the file doesn't exist, so S3 returns 403 on an existing file and not 404, I actually don't return 403 to the browser, but I return a 307, 
and I replace the host name with my CloudFront host name. Oh, sorry, with my um, HTTP AP, uh, API host name, which is defined here in my, in my CloudFormation template. So that's really like the neat trick to redirect every missed request in S3 to another domain. And then I have my CloudFront distribution, which is fairly simple too. It's a bucket that has an S3 website bucket as an origin. Uh, with the, the same things, uh, redirect to HTTPS to be sure that we are always in HTTPS. But here I have to put a default TTL of zero. That's to avoid to cache the 307 that come back from the, from the bucket. So the 307, I really don't want to cache them. Uh, sorry, the, the mint detail does that. So since uh, S3 doesn't send back a, a cache control header, the mint detail here says that if there's no cache header, don't cache it. And then my, my Lambda function that's below behind the API gateway, um, it's a bit of messy code because yeah, that's how I, how I work. But we will kind of take, so I, I use a library called Sharp to do that. And I am just taking in the params and working with Sharp to like transform with height and gravity and other things. We'll see that in action. I think the important here is not the code, but it's the functionalities. And so if I go now to, see, to, to show you how it looks like. So I basically have my two buckets and I should have an API gateway Actually, it's kind of useless to show you that, but let's let's upload some images there. Oh, I need that. Why do I do that with CLI? CLI. So I have two. I have two images ready. That I will just upload. So I ch I've chosen two images. First is a uh, mountain view. So the first images is is a mountain view of Switzerland because that's my country of origin, and it's it's a landscape picture. And the second image that I'm using is. For Lisbon, yeah. It's a picture of a tram in Lisbon because that's where I'm living currently. And it's a portrait mode, so I needed the two pictures. And if I go now to my original bucket, we'll see that the two pictures I, I uploaded are here. So the, my Lisbon tram and my Switzerland mountains. So, so far, nothing has happened. Uh, I just store these images in the cloud. So now let's call one of these images to see what happened. Let's go there to I have not all the plugins polluting my my network calls. So as you can see here, the first reply was a 307. And then a 301 from the API gateway. So here you can see the URL is API gateway. And then back to CloudFront. And I got my image. And now I have a nice image that I defined to be a 640 times 480 and in crop mode. If I do now the same with my with my tram picture. Again, I, I want a whip of 640, a height of 480. So the same parameters. And now you see that compared to the original, it's like cropped now in the middle. So my vertical image was taken into horizontal 
and cropped in the middle. But this Trump picture is not really nice to be cropped in the middle. So as a designer of a website, I say, no, this image I don't like. I, I, will, I, will, I want it to be cropped from the bottom. So I, I add this parameter, gravity bottom. And now it's the bottom of my image that's taken. And every time I'm doing that, you can see here on the right is the image doesn't exist on, um, in S3. So it returns me at 307. I go to the API gateway and then back to, to CloudFront. And now what if this image is actually, no, I, I, I like the whole image of this tram. So I change another, I, I change another parameter. I use, I don't use a uh, crop, but I use pad. And I want a square one because my design of my website really needs a square image. So I do a pad and what's that? I don't want to search, sorry. Did you like? Yeah. So here I put square and to not have any color that is on the extension of my image, I decided to put it black. I could have put it uh, red. Yeah, and sorry, that's the only two hex code I know by heart. <coughs> and so with that, we, we were able to get these images pretty fast and in the format that we, that we want without having to ask a designer or upload anything. Now, if I come back to my first image, my, my, my landscape image, and I will, I will clear here so that we can see better. And you see that now a second request, it's directly at 200 from CloudFront. And if I go even here, it was a miss from CloudFront, so it had to fetch it from the, from the bucket. And if now I refresh again, do I have my cache disabled? Yes. If I fetch it again, we'll see now that it's a hit from CloudFront and the request timing went like, I guess, really better. Do we see that here? Timings. Yeah, so it took 50 milliseconds. So now if someone comes to fetch an image that already exists, that already cached, you reduce the time for like almost from one second that we had before to around uh, like a few milliseconds, 40 milliseconds now. And yeah, so that's it for the image. So just to see what happened to our bucket. So my, our original bucket didn't change. The image is still there. But now what happened in our cache bucket? So in our cache bucket, I see that now my Lisbon tram JPEG was the name of the original, has a slash behind it. So it has become a folder. I have my version number. And then I have all these parameters that I passed. So the red border, the white border, uh, the bottom border. And here is the image that is served. And if you look at the differences on sizes, this cropped image here is 50K. And if I go to the original, it's a 3.8 meg. So we went down from 3.8 meg image to a 50K image. Okay, so what did we build here? So it's only new formats that need to be processed. So if we have now an increase in client requests. So suddenly we have a, a, a post or an article that becomes viral and we increase the amount of clients that come see this page. We don't need any additional processing. Our CDN or even S3 will just eat the load without any issues. And it's also cost effective because we pay only for the used storage. Even if you pay when nobody uses it for the storage, we hadn't the need to buy like a few petabytes of disk before we even start doing that. And um, once, I've, once we've written the code, deploying that takes, because of CloudFront, roughly like 15 minutes. So you, let's say in, in, in less than one hour, you're ready to go and to serve images. And you haven't spent one cent on that for now. 
And if, if say, for one month, you don't have new images that you want to, to, to create, you don't create new articles, or there's no clients coming for some reason, you won't pay for the idle cost. And it's also scalable because if there's a new format that is needed, a new size, sorry, that's needed, I should not use the word size here, not format, it's created only once. So the amount of Lambda invocation or API calls is really, really minimum. And the number of requests in client increases, Cloudflare S3 can just handle that. They are built for this kind of, of traffic. You can store as many images as you want because you basically have infinite storage with S3. And also we are able to handle any future DPR screen or sizes. So now suddenly Apple announces a, an ultra retina screen, uh, 16 DPI, but you just have to change your query string to 16 DPI and it's, it's done. Um, to get you an idea of the cost, I, I, I ran some numbers. Uh, so let's say you upload 1,000 images each month. And we see like a, a raw image is, is roughly four gig. I went a bit overboard saying that each image has 10 variations. And the total of storage will be three gig, which is probably more than the reality. And that creating a variation takes 1.5 seconds. And that we have roughly 1 million client requests that on average take 600 KB each. So if you look at the API requests, there will be 10,000 API requests because we have 10 variation times 1,000 images. That's uh, one to two cents. Then we invoke Lambda 10,000 times. That's a 0 0.2 cents. Then the Lambda execution, one and a half seconds at a, at a one mega a provision lambda function, 25 cents. And that's why I was saying that reducing the amount of lambda execution really helps on the bill because that's actually the expensive part. It's 25 cents, that's not much, but if you sum it up, if you can reduce 50% of that, it makes a happy CFO. And then the storage cost for the four gig, it's roughly uh, 10 cents. And for all the variation will be like seven cents. So it's a total monthly cost of 45, 44 cents to run that with 1000 images. And you see that I didn't put the request in there. That's because regardless of what you use to store your images or create them, be it uh, an EC2 uh, in-house or um, Docker or Lambda, the traffic to the client will be always there. You always will have to pay for it. But a rough estimate on the 1 million user at 600K is roughly $50 a month of CloudFront cost. Because don't forget, cost from S3 to CloudFront is free and you pay from CloudFront to the client. But if you go directly to S3, you pay the same amount. So there's no additional cost on having a CDN in front of the storage. So is it used in production? Big yes, and that's a shameless plug. It's my own photo gallery. I am using that to, to generate the different rendition for different screens. And I built for that a tool called yapawa.net. If you're interested in image, check it out. It's like a serverless static image hosting. And it was really made to remove my, my LAMP server and to, to basically have something cheap because I don't upload often and then I have almost nobody coming to see pictures. So why pay 24 seven for a server for that? And do you have commercial services for that? Obviously, yes. So to name a few of them, I think the most well-known will be Cloudinary. And everything I've shown here, like the path and, and having this crop and all that, it's really like a taken away uh, from Cloudinary. So I, I kind of heavily inspired from what they're doing. There are other services, Image Kit, Image IX, they're doing exactly that. So they will host the images for you. They will run the, the queries for you. They maintain everything for you. And they have uh, plugins for most frameworks where you basically either fetch from your own storage or you can directly store your originals with them. 
but obviously the cost is there's a cost associated to it. So how could we improve on what we've done so far? Because it's really simple, and there's probably a few areas we can improve on. So how could we reduce the first execution time? That's kind of the big bug, uh, bummer in, in, in the whole solution. So if we know our use variation, we could pre-generate them. So every time you would upload a new file to the S3 original bucket, you could trigger a Lambda function that will pre-generate all the most used variation for that particular image. And you probably will end up with a bunch of five that will be the most used ones. Um, and you could, through passing CloudFront logs or choose to passing S3 inventory files after a while that you run that, you can actually see a pattern what kind of variations are used the most. Um, something I didn't put here, but no, I, I took that later. Um, then there's the cross-region latency, and that's so, often something that we forget about. Is that to say, ah, oh, I have a CDN, I have my bucket, and in my example here, my bucket uh, that I created, my bucket was in Frankfurt, and I did that because that's the nearest uh, AWS region for me. But now, if a customer from the US comes, and it's not in his CloudFront cache. CloudFront will have to fetch all the way through the Atlantic from Frankfurt to get the image. And you have a latency there. It takes time to do that. So if you want to be faster with that, you could replicate your bucket to different region and have a Lambda Edge function that will choose the bucket nearest to the CloudFront uh, distribution. So meaning have a bucket in Europe, have a bucket in Australia, have a bucket in Asia, have a bucket in the US. And perhaps one in South America, depends where your customers are. Then there will be something to choose automatically between JPEG and WebP. So now it's the client who has to choose that. So we could have a CloudFront function or a CloudFront Lambda Edge function. Uh, as long as you only work with headers, CloudFront function is faster and cheaper than Lambda Edge and easier to maintain than Lambda Edge functions. And then based on the accept header, we could actually rewrite the, the backend request to, to fetch JPEG or WebP. Then obviously that adds cost because your CloudFront function will be invoked on every client request. So if you have more customers coming to see your images, your bill will increase. Um, then you could also increase the cache hits. So if someone has perhaps noticed that in the parameters I have, I put the width and the height as a parameter, but if I put height, height and width with the same numbers, it will give me the same image, but from a cache point of view, or from an from a, uh, S3 existence point of view, it's a different file. So I, I will have to create the same file twice. So we could have a CloudFront function again to normalize the URL, to make sure that the, uh, the order is always the same, everything is small case. And at the same time, we could also then round up the numbers because if someone asks for a 270 pixel image or a two and someone else for a 271 pixel, that's a new file. Then we could also use some, the fact that we upload to S3 and then that we have Lambda triggers on S3 to pass some info out of an image, exif data, run it to Amazon recognition, and then populate a database with all these values so that you can actually then search your image database based on these keywords. And again, that all adds the, to the to the global cost. Um, yeah, and what what is in store for the future? And so there's something called client hints that was an initiative from Google a few years back. It took some time to to go into the uh, all the browsers. It's almost there. Sadly, it's always the two same usual suspects that are lacking this feature. But what, what will that will allow us to do is that inside your web page, you say that your site accepts client hints and I want to send a few variables. So there's like few port width, the downlink speed, or the other parameters, the, the, the memory, the connection type. And then you just have one single image tag like this. And automatically the browser will send inside the header all these values will say, hey, my image width, like my viewport width or my, or my div width is that I need, that's the width I need. My DPR or deep, uh, is, is this amount, that's what I need. 
my, my container width, my device memory, my downlink, or my connection type. And then based on that, through headers and CloudFront functions and, or, or Lambda Edge functions, you could then start to automatically choose what to serve to your client. So this removes all the huge picture tag that we had in the beginning, or the client having to, to make all the knowledge about his own device. But sadly, yeah, it's a bit, I think, early to use. I know that people like Cloudinary are using that when possible. So you can basically size width equals auto in the, in the resizing methodologies. But for now, yeah, I, I don't know if it's production ready since there are like still two browsers that are not using it. Yeah, so that's it, a bit faster than I expected. And am I able to see the Q&A? No, I'm not. Ah, yes, I am. I don't know if there's more questions than the one that are already there. So there's one and I can sort of speak to it. Thank you, Ahmad, uh, for wanting to check out the code a bit more uh, bit more in detail. But I don't I don't know if it's in our this is if there's a version of this that could be put in our templates repo, Daniel. But if so, then we can send uh, send that out to everyone who signed up with the uh, with the recording of the webinar and that could be potentially helpful. What the the slides you mean or the, yeah, yeah with the slides and then this is all recorded so we usually send a yep. link out to that as well. But if there is a like some of the some of the code that you shared that made this happen. Yeah that was so shareable I, uh, yeah, it's shareable. I, I haven't put it on, on GitHub. I can push it. Yeah. Okay, great. Cool. So fantastic. That'll definitely happen. Yeah, yeah. it's just that the, yeah, don't, don't blame me on the code. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like uh, simple and efficient and not nice and maintainable. For sure. So yeah, so I went a bit faster. I, I was afraid that they didn't have enough time. They wouldn't have enough time. So I, I went a bit fast on some some parts so I don't know if there's like some some of the part I, I need to go into more detail or I, I need to explain more I'm, I'm happy to do that well uh, Ahmad just sent and said that uh, we're all coders so feel so and we feel the same about our code so looks like we're all in good company <laughs> here which is perfect yeah that's like you always like when you present your stuff and you see you what you like you're like yeah don't look too much at that it's a bit dirty it's like like the Zoom stuff with the messy room behind you. Exactly, exactly. All right. Let's see. Any other any other questions or anything else people would like to people would like to hear about? Let's see. Daniel, do you happen to know if um, what was it? Was it a uh, Firefox and Safari that were lagging behind a bit? Yeah. Do yeah. they have that on their roadmap at all? Do you uh, happen to know as far as when they're thinking about it, or do they just so not care? There's always a nice website. It's called Can I Use? And you say client hints. So that's the the current state of client hints. So one year ago it was really bad. Now it's it's basically every everyone that's a, a Chrome based is is green. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Firefox. I heard is on the roadmap, but. Since it was proposed by Google, the, the Firefox maintainers are like, yeah, we don't want to hear about that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like yet another stuff from Google to like steal our data. Uh, I, I think for, for, for designers, it's like, it's, it's like really neat. Like for, for front-end developer, it's really, really great to have these client hints. Because you, there's some example from the blog post from, uh, on, on Google is with the guy who, who proposed that is, is that basically uh, like if you download speed is less than a certain amount don't even bother showing any image and and so oh, wow. you so, so it's like like everything with google it's all about the the client feeling like that's why they have a google amp it's it's just that everything that's loaded on your mobile should be snappy and so it's it's up to the to, to, to the website developer to to make sure that he serves the right stuff in the right conditions and I think that's the whole idea behind behind this kind of hints, because it's really a pain to get the like the DPR width and and all that. Yeah. Uh, and once you start toying between Web WebP and JPEG, it's it's crazy. Like you have like for each image is like twenty lines of of, of tags just for an image. 
Yeah, perhaps something I didn't emphasize enough on it is like the benefit of WebP and now that most of the browsers except Safari are supporting it, mm -hmm. like Firefox, Chrome, Edge, but not Safari is that you really get almost a reduction at like 20% in size compared to JPEG without visual loss of quality. So it's really worth like going down the, the WebP road to, to have stuff load faster uh, and, and snappier on, on especially for people that are like on on like 3G networks or ADSL if that still exists nowadays. No, definitely. Because I know what is it? All of the um, all the metrics around like the business metrics and marketing metrics around like how like load times affect uh, just sort of like your end user experience. It's really helpful to have these loading very, very quickly and just seamless for a design because, you know, what was it? Many years ago, I remember them saying like, oh, one day, like you have to like these will all be on televisions again. Um, and the other day, and I never really thought that was going to happen. Uh, but the other day I was like watching YouTube on my TV and it sort of came full circle. So now all of like that programmatic advertisements that went to YouTube are now back on TV. And so everything has to be able to be designed, not just for mobile, but this 4k, yeah, the, maybe the, the 18k you, experience. You, you have to design for mobile 3g. Mm -hmm. have to design like or, or like really old phones that have like that are like one dpi and, and and 640 pixels width and 3g but the same phone can actually work on a 5, 4g plus or 5g then you have your tv that might work on a on, on a fiber line but also work on adsl so you have to have like small images small speeds small images big speeds <laughs> like like yeah. the spectrum is like awfully wide and when i worked in the video space that was like awful because you had to ship videos to like small devices, high speed, small devices, slow speed, and it was even worse than with images. But yeah, it's a headache to, to be able to ship the right content to the right people so that they have the best experience possible. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of use cases to, to solve for. So we got a couple more questions, uh, one from Benoit. And uh, could we avoid the 307 redirect and have API Gateway plus Lambda return the reduced image in the first request? No, so the the three or seven not because you cannot you cannot have um, um, oh yes you could sorry you could if you have a lambda edge function that will listen on the client response and it sees that the response is three or seven and then this lambda edge function would do something for that but then you enter the same problem with um, uh, with everything lambda edge is that it has a body a limit in the body size. So if your image is too big, you are not able to reply. So you might get rid of the 307, but not of the 30, was it 301 or 302? You probably want to like store it to S3 and then tell the browser like, hey, fetch it back, make a new request. But yeah, if you have a, a Lambda Edge function that, that acts on client response, on uh, backend response, that's fine because it, it will be only run if there is not if there's nothing like if the response is a is a poor tree but you would need to look on the body now because yeah there, there might be some tricks with the body i my first version of that when i when i built that a bit more than one year ago was all with lambda edge and then i ran into troubles on bigger images so like uh, like full hd even like starting at full hd i started to run into uh, into image size problems and 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 lambda edge body sizes Nice, nice. And then we had uh, another question, which was sort of what got you interested in serverless and how does this person know if like it's really the right direction for their team, uh, which is kind of a broad question without knowing like, are they meaning like specifically like for images, image hosting uh, or like in a broader sense, but I don't know. Oh, I think in a, broad, in a broader sense, it's like image was, so uh, I, I chose to speak about images because it's, it has a, let's say a visual appeal to it. Um, Definitely. I think everything started about serverless is I had, I had files in S3 and I was kind of running uh, cron jobs on an EC2 to uh, every hour and so to, to, do, to do work with these files. And if I remember right, AWS came out with Lambda function and the, f the first thing that Lambda function could do was actually be triggered from an S3 event. 
And that was like, kind of like, oh, that's amazing. Like something new happens on S3, trigger Lambda and, and, and do the job, work on it. And that allowed me to like reduce having EC2s uh, lying around, uh, just doing cron jobs. So paying, paying even a micro 24 seven to run something once a day, yeah, that's really stupid. So being able to like trigger something when an event happens, only when something happens, that's the, like, I think that was like the, the, the stuff that like made me think, oh, that's like a really great tool. And then obviously when you, when you start working on it, like I've said that I had to maintain servers in Iraq. Yeah. Um, once you don't have to worry about APT get upgrade anymore, uh, yeah, my God, you have so much free time. <laughs> like, <laughs> like obviously, the, then the free time is goes into coding, and then you have no more free time anymore. But you don't end up like looking at HTTP request on Apache, and then don't understand why your Apache module suddenly doesn't work anymore after the latest kernel upgrade, like this kind of thing. Like, just pay some money, a little bit of money to AWS for for managing an API gateway for you. Uh, it, it will be cheaper than the salary of your system engineer anyway. So uh, yeah, so I think it's just like a neat way to not to not have to worry about all this hardware stuff. Doesn't mean you don't have to know what's happening. So you you need to know that what's the difference between a, a 500 meg uh, lambda or, or a 10 gig lambda cost efficiency and all that. You still need to know that, but you don't have to bother too much about OSs and uh, and network firewalls and this kind of stuff. Yeah, no, it's a definitely a good value proposition exchange. I know back when Serverless Guru still had an office in Portland, one of the people working with us, their old company was moving out of their uh, out of their office floor because uh, above them was like a fitness gym, and uh, they had showers, and the piping leaked, and it leaked right over their server room, and I think it fried like two million dollars worth of hardware. So they just decided to shut down their Portland location and then just yeah, be no, New York like only. Uh, well, I think that's more a discussion for for in-house and and uh, and cloud, like yeah, yeah, um, like the the kind of people you know to run a data center is such a big skill that is needed. Is like, why do you want to hire them yourself? Like, give that to someone else. And you kind of know that if if the major big players and even the the U.S. government is trusting AWS with the data centers. Uh, you probably could too. Exactly. And uh, and yeah, having like yeah, I I worked for a company where we had the production server under the desk, and yeah, it happened once. Like you kick the the server and and you unplug the power cable. Oh wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so that's the kind of stuff you yeah you really don't don't want. And but that's like going to the cloud and how, how you use the cloud, if it's EC2s, bare metal, uh, Docker, or, or some other things. And that's, that depends on your, on your business model or, or, your, or the skills of the people that, that are working with you. Uh, serverless comes with its own challenge compared to a, to a Docker instance or, or even bare metal. That's definitely clear. Let's see. Let's see if we have any other questions. Hopefully, you know, feel free to let us know if we answered those um, appropriately. And if not, feel free to send us another message. But I don't see anything, you know, no one's uh, running at us with pitchforks. So it seems like we were able to answer those. Uh, you were able to answer those quite well. So thank you, Daniel. Yeah, welcome. A pleasure. It's kind of weird to present and not like I'm used to, to my, my previous presentation where it's like Amazon user groups and you have like the crowd in front of you and you can kind of see the the faces and and realize if they like if they are lost or not and then you can like re-explain it here here I have no clue like it's really it's really weird to do that over Zoom like that yeah it's, it's, it's a different feeling <laughs> no it definitely is and somehow there's a setting where I can't turn my camera back on or else I would be you know pretending to be you know somewhat of a human in person um, <laughs> yeah no, no, it's just like sometimes just like looking at at, at what what's the expression in the eyes of, of the, at least the front row because that's the one you can see and like you realize that oh I'm just saying something way too complicated or way out of line I need to I need to readjust my speech.
yeah everyone's eyes is, eyes glaze over and that sort of thing ben wants this thank you um uh, yeah no it's and i also want to extend and say thank you so much for jumping on to uh to you know help host this webinar and talk about a topic that is you know kind of engaging and exciting and um i know we i think we've all had horrible experiences of images and slow loading times on websites so it's a pretty visceral uh connection rather than than something else uh so this is i i definitely enjoyed this in that sort of way and i definitely always enjoy getting to hear you talk or talk about um, just the technology and how you think the problem. So this was super valuable for me and I hope it was super valuable for the rest of our viewers. Fantastic. And so, you know, if any other questions pop up, and we got another thank you in the Q&A, um, and like presenting online can definitely be strange. Thank you for such an amazing presentation. Got some more thank yous. Uh, from there. And if any other questions come up for Daniel or for Serverless Guru, or if people are interested in, you know, leveraging our experience and Daniel's experience and our team's experience, um, you know, feel free to go on our website, serverlessguru.com. Um, reach out to us on our contact form. We'd love to talk with, to you about how to, uh, you know, just sort of fully optimize your your projects and your companies and your serverless transformations. Uh, we love to do that. We do that every day. And um, yeah, so I think we'll, we'll definitely leave it at that. Perfect, perfect. So let me stop the recording.